Thanks very much. Um, thanks for inviting me for the very kind introduction. I left London and I left the snow behind me. Mm -hmm. and the cold and I said, I'm going to Australia and New Zealand, it's going to be great. It's going to be a big nice sunshine. And uh, I arrived in Melbourne, which I understand had a heat wave until I arrived, and the heavens opened and there was a downpour. So, okay, so I'm going to, then I went to Wellington, which I understand had also had a heat wave. And this downpour arrived as the wheels touched down in Melbourne. So I'm really glad to be in Sydney, where um, you've come through for me, and it's, uh, it's a beautiful sunny day. So um, thanks very much for that. Um, I'm going to be speaking tonight about what I think is a window of opportunity to breathe some life back into the two state paradigm, the two state framework. What I'm going to be doing is talking about um, the prospects for peace. Where are we now? What have the obstacles been to peace so far? Why isn't the one state solution an alternative? What is this window of opportunity? Why am I cautiously optimistic about the potential of 2030 to make progress? And how? How do we make practical steps forward towards a two state solution between the Israelis and the Palestinians? So I think we're at a crossroads moment. One can see great dangers ahead if there's no political momentum injected into the relationship between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And on the other hand, we can see a window of opportunity to revive the process. So let's be realistic to begin with and state that where we are is not a positive place. After some 20 years between 1993 and the Oslo Agreement and 2013, we have not succeeded. Moreover, since the 2007-2008 when the Annapolis process looked so promising, we haven't made any progress and in fact may have gone backwards. Let's try and establish why we think that would be. There are a number of issues. Firstly, there are remaining gaps between the two parties. It's often said that we all know the solution. This is to some degree misleading because whether it's refugees, Jerusalem, borders, land swaps, security, the Jordan Valley, demilitarization, the contiguity of the Palestinian state, progress has been made for sure Gaps were narrowed in Annapolis, but the two parties couldn't reach a full agreement on all of those issues. So there's now a set of issues that need negotiating still. Secondly, there's been an erosion of trust between the two political leaderships. And related to that, an erosion of trust that the two peoples have in the framework itself. So both peoples are very skeptical that they have a negotiating partner on the other side. Israelis are skeptical of Palestinians, Palestinians are skeptical of Israelis. Thirdly, I think we've had some policy errors. I think President Obama today and at his press conference more or less admitted that the first term effort to have a full settlement freeze without differentiating between any kinds of settlements was a mistake. It put President Abbas into a corner. It was very hard for him to be more moderate than a Palestinian, uh, an American president, and it meant that the Israeli Prime Minister didn't feel he could make those moves either, especially after having a 10 month freeze didn't reduce the Palestinians' commitment to the negotiating process. I think fourthly, the Palestinians turned to unilateralism and to the United Nations and to legalizing the process and taking it away from politics and negotiation towards the General Assembly and the Security Council has also been a problem. Fifth, we had the rise of Hamas which is in control of the Gaza Strip and the failure of reconciliation talks between Hamas and Fatah, which means the Palestinian national movement is split, which means, as people say in Israel, it's now like Noah's Ark, there's two of everything, two negotiating partners, two policy positions. Who do you negotiate with for a final status agreement? Sixth, the Arab Spring, even though it's been tremendous for many people in terms of um, overthrowing old tyrannies and dictatorships, has created some problems for the peace process. It means that the security threats, the instability, the change in security environment around Israel is such that many policymakers feel it's not the time to make a compromise or a risk for peace. It's the time to hunger down and to see how this develops. It means that support for President Abbas and Fatah is in decline to some extent because of the rise of Islamist forces which have been looking more towards supporting Hamas. Qatar, for instance, is putting $400 million into the Gaza Strip towards Hamas, but isn't supporting Qatar in the same way. Qatar itself begins to look a little bit anachronistic when you look around the Arab Spring development 
secular Arab nationalism, wherever you look at the region, is in decline. New Islamist forces are on the rise. That again makes it very difficult for President Abbas to make the kind of bold gestures for peace, the compromises for peace that the process may require. So I'm, going, I'm starting off on a pessimistic note. Don't worry, I'll end up much more optimistic. But I think where, where we are, you have to be realistic. And that's, that's one of the places we're at. The temptation is to say, in, in response to that, we just need to manage the status quo. All we can do is manage what we have. Let's just keep the status quo going. And there's judgments on that. Some people think that's possible. I don't share that view. I don't think the status quo is tenable or sustainable. I don't think it's tenable in the short term or the long term. In the short term, we're witnessing some negative developments. The Palestinian Authority itself is in difficulty. It has a fiscal crisis. When I was in Ramallah in September, there were some riots of Palestinians, not in Israel, but in the South by the Prime Minister and the Bas, the President. The President has um, talked and um, had talked about giving the keys back possibly to Israel, feeling that the Palestinian Authority is not something that he can manage. In the short term, then, there's real dangers of a negative development. In the absence of a political process, we've seen this development happen. Palestinians go to the United Nations and propose to act unilaterally there. In response, Israel gives zoning and planning permission to a new settlement development in the E1 area outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is not building, but it's a response to that. In response to that, the Palestinians have talked about going to the International Criminal Court. In response to that, the Israelis have talked about cutting off some of the transfers of tax revenues and so on to the Palestinian government. All of that is a negative dynamic that we need to, to stop and to get things moving in the other direction. Also, there's been a low level, simmering level of violence in the West Bank, Molotov cocktails, uh, stones thrown in cars, which had a tragic outcome in Montauba uh, only last week, and some burning tires, and some protests, and no one's talking third and Tafada, we're not there. There's no mood for that, I don't think, at the West Bank, but it's not a stable situation, it's not really sustainable in the absence of a political track. In the longer term, I don't think it's sustainable either, because unless the land between the river and the sea is divided, then in a period of time, the majority of people living in the area between the land and the sea will be Arab. At which point, Israel's character as a Jewish and democratic state comes under challenge. If it wants to remain a Jewish state, it can't give citizenship to the majority. If it wants to remain a democratic state, give citizenship to all, how does it remain a Jewish majority country and a Jewish homeland rather than another Arab state in the region? So in the longer term, and in the shorter term, I don't think the status quo is sustainable. So, for me, this puts the imperative on getting some life back into the two-state process. For some people, and I want to just talk about this for a few minutes, they say, well, if the two-state solution is, is finished, why not go for a one-state solution? where everyone is a citizen between the river and the sea, and we all get on together. Now, with, with all due respect to those people who support that solution, I'm going to start off my response to that by quoting George Orwell, who said that some ideas are so absurd that you can only get the intellectuals to believe in them. And I think the one-state solution is definitely one of those. It rests on a series of flawed arguments. Firstly, there's a real keyhole history look at Zionism, a really simplistic look at Zionism. It's no longer the national movement of the Jewish people, the national liberation movement of the Jewish people, but a separate colonial project, wholly European, wholly exploitative, that the state itself was born in sin, and therefore it has no rights to self-determination, and we need to roll history back to 1947-48 and undo the creation of Israel. I think that's a wholly flawed argument, which misses out on the great, two great material facts about the history, what one rabbi called the longing and the boot. The longing being the long relationship that the Jewish people have to the land of Israel and the longing for it, and the boot being the unprecedented record of discrimination, pogrom, and holocaust faced by the Jewish people, which produced the triumph of Zionism amongst the Jewish people and the conviction that they needed a state of their own. Now that, that complicated tangled history needs to be put to the forefront, not a, a, a simplistic story of a settler colonial project. Secondly, people say the two-state solution is dead, killed by the settlements. I think this is wrong. I think one of the things that we need to say increasingly is that we need a more sophisticated political language around the settlement issue if we're going to get a solution. The facts are these, really. The settlements have not killed the two-state solution. 
the real difficulty in implementing the idea of partition remains political, not physical. After all, most Israeli settlements are concentrated in blocks. Those blocks are concentrated around the Green Line. Quite capable of being included in a deal in the form of one-for-one -one land swaps for compensating the land going to the Palestinians. Those Israeli settlement blocks around the Green Line, um, in the most working settlers are employed inside Israel. Israeli settlements use largely distinct infrastructure from West Bank Palestinians. Many settlers are economically motivated, therefore more likely to move voluntarily in the event of peace. And the number of new homes currently being planned for construction within Israel is some 20 times the number of households that might need to be relocated. If we develop the language in which we were able to distinguish between what I would call block settlers and hilltop settlers, I think politically it would be a very good thing. Block settlers are some 80% of the settlers, and they're grouped around those major blocks around the Green Line which in all substantive negotiations have the two sides, the two sides have talked about, negotiated their inclusion inside Little Israel, Green Line Israel, Coast Deal Israel, whatever we want to call it. By contrast, the hilltop settlers, often um, national religious, dotted along Route 60 from the ridge, um, are another matter, and they will have to be dealt with um, by the two parties in discussions. But to connect the block settlers around the Green Line to Israel, we're talking about some land swaps of, in the region, I think it's three to six percent. We're talking about 20 to 30,000 households which would have to be absorbed back into Israel thereafter, not the half million settlers of um, some irresponsible economy. So I don't think it's the case that the settlements, I think the settlements are difficult. They signal that as much as anything to the world community that Israel uh, doesn't want to make progress. I'm not saying for a second that they're not problematic, I think they are. But we don't, we shouldn't get ourselves caught in a language which says, two-state solution is finished because of settlements. It's entirely possible to have a viable, contiguous Palestinian state in the West Bank um, at this present time. That's, that's an argument. There's not an argument that the two-state solution is, uh, the, uh, is unjust because only the return of all of the refugees would represent justice. I think this is politically useless as an argument. At the last set of negotiations that were serious at Annapolis, we know that the Israelis were offering some 50,000 humanitarian refugees uh, to come back into Israel proper. The Palestinian response was some 150,000. Both of those numbers are manageable as humanitarian and symbolic um, moves. What is not manageable at all is the idea that some five or six million Palestinian refugees to the third and fourth generation have the right to move back into Israel proper. What that would do is remove the right of national self-determination of the Jewish people and, for that matter, the right of national self-determination of the Palestinians. A more politically viable option is to say that the Palestinian refugees can return to the newly created Palestinian state and not to Israel. The one-state solution is anti-democratic. The two peoples don't want the one-state solution. Two-thirds of both of the peoples want the two-state solution. The one-state solution people ignore this. They say, well, why don't you just give up the nation state? It's so last century. Why don't we all live together and so on? Except that it isn't last century. We've just lived through a real purple patch in terms of the creation of nation states built on ethnic majorities. As the USSR broke up, as Yugoslavia broke up, even as those um, hipsters in Czechoslovakia, the laid-back, easy-going, velvet underground-loving Czechoslovakians decided that if it was OK with you, we'll just split up into the Czech Republic and Slovakia. So to accept, expect Israel to be the sole country to give up its nation state in that way is entirely unrealistic and actually quite a dubious proposition. The one state solution is also politically impossible. Only the most vague and gestural notions exist of what it would look like. And in the words of the Israeli novelist Amos Oz, the fact is that no one has anywhere to go to, and we cannot form one happy family, he says, because we're not happy and we're not a family and we need to separate. It's senseless, he carries on, to push into a honeymoon bed with deadly enemies who have been involved in fighting and bitterness and bloodshed for over a hundred years. But being asked to believe that the IDF and the Alaska commanders will be able to form one military unit is simply brutally <coughs> impossible. But what the one state solution can be, I think, is a cover for the old goal of conquest. Fools do not propose one state with the intention of conquest, but the maids do. And I put it to you that the maids roam the global BDS movement. Writing in a new collection after Zionism, Omar Barghouti 
um, of the BDS movement rejected any expression of Jewish self-determination and said, by definition, the two-state solution infringes the inalienable rights of the indigenous Palestinians to a part of their homeland. You can't be much plainer than that. It's about revisiting Fort Yid and undoing the state of Israel itself. The one-state solution gets wrong what the conflict is actually about. It's two highly developed and distinct societies, Israeli and Palestinian, each based on a powerful sense of national identity, which must divide the land. Where there are strong desires for national self-determination, the one-state idea collapses. The current supporters on the Zionist side in the past, back in the 1920s, the British Shalom, the binational Zionist movement, and supported the one-state solution. History went the other way and we need to move with this. To divide the land, each people needs to feel confident and secure if it's going to make the excruciating compromises necessary. For each people to feel that needs to be understood as a permanent feature of the Middle East. One state has talked just the opposite. It proposes to resolve a national question by denying the right of national self-determination to both peoples. So, I don't think that's a solution. So if the one state solution isn't a way forward, what is? Is there any grounds to be optimistic about the two-state solution? And here I will strike a note of cautious optimism in the context of Barack Obama's visit and the context of the new Israeli coalition. So let's register some reasons to be cautiously optimistic about the potential for getting the two-state solution back on track. One, the two people still support the two-state solution. They may not think the solution is possible tomorrow. They may have skepticism about the other side, but in principle, they're still for dividing the land. That's the bedrock reason why we need to keep up um, our hope for this paradigm to be what directs politicians in the years ahead. Secondly, the international community still supports that solution. The United Nations, which Australia now has a seat on the Security Council for the next two years, the US and the EU. Thirdly, the Arab states still support the two-state solution. I think this is absolutely critical. If Mahmoud Abbas and Salah Bayad are going to make compromises necessary to make the deal a success, it will certainly need cover from the surrounding Arab states in the region. And the Arab peace plan is annually reaffirmed and has been reaffirmed. I would expect to see some um, attempt by the Americans included, as my view, to remind people of the Arab peace plan and to make it part of the negotiations in 2013, and to try to involve some actors from the Arab world also. Fourthly, the Israeli elections produced a more centrist government and a more centrist Knesset. It's a mixed picture, but nonetheless, some of the elements of the picture are these. Firstly, Zibi Livni, the key negotiator in Atlas, has been given a role in the new Israeli government of leading the negotiations with the Palestinians. That indicates to the Palestinians seriousness. It also indicates to me, given that Netanyahu became under pressure to remove Livni from that role in the, in the coalition negotiations and resisted it, left her in place um, signals his seriousness to me. Secondly, the rise of this <coughs> new politician, Yair Lapid, and his uh, Yesha Tid party, there is a future. They certainly argued mostly on domestic grounds. They broke through as the party of the middle class, the party that wanted to share the burden in Israel and close the economic gaps. That's absolutely for sure. But in terms of their position on the process, the peace process, they said they called the two-state solution and it's not a fig leaf for them, it's one of their red lines about staying in the coalition is that genuine progress is made on that track. Certainly there are forces inside the new coalition in Knesset who are very skeptical to oppose to the two-state solution, Natalie Bennett's Jewish Home Party being one of them. However, he has said he's not going to break up the coalition just because there's negotiations happening. He's not going to get in the way of negotiations. That's important. Secondly, the Labour Party leader Shelley Yakamovich has said publicly on the Knesset floor only a few days ago, I will support this government if it makes progress in the two state um, negotiations from within the Knesset and if necessary from inside the government. That's another positive fact. Also, the Prime Minister himself, there's many views about um, Netanyahu and his seriousness in the process. Just to remind ourselves of some facts, and but at the Bar Ilan University speech, he committed himself and his part to the two-state solution. It can be forgotten how unprecedented that was, how paradigm-breaking that was for a Likud party leader to commit himself to a Palestinian state. He was able to institute a 10-month settlement freeze in the hope that the Palestinians would be drawn into negotiations. He was able to negotiate the Wai River 
agreement in 1998. He said repeatedly he has no intention of allowing Israel to drift into the binational state that we talked about earlier. Only uh, yesterday he talked about the historic compromise that the Israeli government would be willing to make if it had a partner on the other side. And in the press conference of Barack Obama, he talked about two states for two peoples. Now, I know there's skepticism. I understand that. But I think in a, if, if the process can be widened out to involve other actors and there's a partner on the other side, then we can see progress. Now, is there a partner on the other side? Victories for optimism would be the Palestinians. For now, I'm not going to talk about Hamas and put Hamas aside. Why am I optimistic about um, the Palestinians? Well, President, uh, President Abbas talked recently in an interview with Israeli television in these terms. He said, I'd like to visit my, the village I grew up in at Safed, but I know I can't live there. I thought this was momentous, I have to say. I thought this was a momentous interview. I know he wrote it back, a little bit of it back, a day later in Arabic to another audience, but nonetheless, for the leader of the Palestinian national movement to make that statement to Israeli television, I thought it was important. I can visit, I understand that, but I'm not going to live there. It's a way of saying, we understand that the right of return is to the new Palestinian state. We get that. Now today, the New York Times is reporting a leaked document, the talking points that are being discussed amongst the Palestinians for his meeting with President Obama in Ramallah. And what we gain from that leak, which looks authentic, that the Palestinians are one, very keen for negotiations, two, ready to soften their demands around settlement freezes to make that possible, and are three, interested in the idea of back-channel discussions, which I'll come on to, uh, away from the, the public gaze, which can facilitate our progress. Second reason to be optimistic about the Palestinians. Let's not forget the phenomenon of Fayyadism. Now, Salman Fayyad, the Palestinian Prime Minister, a Bain, educated, a man who's introduced a series of changes in Palestinian society based on the idea of bottom-up nation building, institution building. So whether that's roads or pipelines, or whether it's the rule of law, or proper security forces who are actually police properly, tackling corruption. Real progress was made on all of those fronts, security cooperation with the IDF. Real progress was made to the extent that the World Bank and the IMF said that the Palestinian state was moving towards being prepared for safer, moving towards. Now, for sure, that has come under threat. In the absence of a political track, it's very hard to keep that economic state building track going. But if we can get progress back into the political track, I think fairism again could begin to take off. And lastly, a reason for optimism is I just think there's no way that Fatah can out be more radical than Hamas. That it has no future in time to be the resistance party. The future of Fatah and Abbas is really we can make the deal. We're the people who can deliver a Palestinian state in the way Hamas never could. So that's my reason for the optimistic there. Why am I optimistic about the Americans? Well, in part it is about President Obama's visit. The visit, I think, is two things at once. It's a public goodwill outreach um, visit. He's trying to re for, warm up his relationship to who, so many now calls Bibi at every conceivable opportunity. Enough already. We, we, we get it. Like, you can have Netanyahu um, you know, his friend. I think you can um, not say Bibi every single time. Um, but that's, that's good. And his, his, the symbolism of his visit, whether it's um, you know, going to the Dead Sea Scrolls to indicate his acknowledgement of the Jewish connection to the land, laying a wreath at the um, at, um, Theodore Herzl's um, burial site with the kicking stance of Jewish homeland, whether it's visiting the new Israeli high-tech innovations, which are tremendous, a startup nation, and whether it's even, I know Michelle knows about this, but it's going on a date with Miss Israel, who also happens to be um, the first uh, Miss Israel of Arab descent in Ethiopia, which is um, again, something beyond symbolism. It indicates something about Israel's diversity and pluralism. He's also bringing a message of goodwill to the Palestinians, recommitting to a Palestinian state, and also, I think he'll have, probably have something in his back pocket when he goes to Ramallah, possibly freeing up some of the 500 million quota in Congress. But it isn't just about the combination of realism, determination, and vision which President Obama has brought in the last 48 hours to the debate. It's also this. The United States foreign policy has a settled view that the two-state solution is in its own national interest. That position was formed over some decades of deliberation, and it's not going away. And it's not going to be put at risk by a chill between the two leaders in the past. We've seen in John Kerry, the new Secretary of State, a man who believes in linkage, linkage between a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian dispute 
and America's own national interest. Joe Biden has talked about naked self-interest being involved in the policy. Kerry has said he has new ideas. He said he wants to jump into the water. After confirmation hearings, his first call was to Mac University to say, don't do anything until I speak to you. I have plans, we need to coordinate. We know for a fact that in DC, the National Security Advisor of Israel, Yaakov Amadro, and Netanyahu's point man on negotiations, it's that multiple have been in discussions with Americans talking about the potential for terms of reference to be agreed for the future substantive negotiations in 2013. We know that Sarberica was in town following them soon after. There's every indication that the Americans are serious about the push. Now, let's not get carried away. I think President Obama felt he was burned a little bit in the first term. He made a big push for peace, and that didn't work out. I think he's learned from that. In the press conference yesterday, he indicated he learned from that. He said, I'm a better person now. He said, I can be more deft than I was before. I understand why some of the uh, moves I made were misinterpreted. He was signaling in a lot of ways that he, he has a better sense now of how to proceed than he did in 2009. 2010. All of that is very positive um, indeed. Second, the seventh reason to be positive, the European Union is desperately keen to make progress. It wants to be supportive, but it wants American leadership. The E3 are very keen to come in behind American leadership and support any push for peace and to, to use their influence to involve some of the Arab actors in the process too. Another reason to be optimistic, the eighth reason would be the deal itself. Yes, we're not there. Yes, and that was failed. And if you narrow your vision to 2008 to the present day, and you say nothing's happened for five years, the settlements have expanded, the Palestinians have gone unilateral, there's no hope, you can think like that. But if you step back a little bit, take a bigger time frame into mind, and you think where we've moved from the 70s or 80s to the present day, this is the picture you get. In the 70s and 80s, neither side had even recognized the other's existence. The Palestinians had not recognized Israel's right to exist at all. The Israelis really didn't quite get ahead around the idea that it was a Palestinian problem to be dealt with. There'd be no substantive negotiations between the two sides, and it was a criminal offense to talk to the PLO. We've moved through a period where it's no longer a criminal offense, there's been mutual recognition, the two sides have recognized each other's existence, they've gone on to recognize the need to negotiate that relationship, they've ended in the substantive negotiations of Camp David in 2000, Taylor, and then in Annapolis. And they came close. Annapolis processed. 30 meetings over three years, Palestinian leaders moving in and out of the Prime Minister's office, maps on the table, negotiators spending hours pouring over them, coming closer, eradicating some of the gaps, identifying where the others were, American involvement in how we could bridge those gaps. All this needs to be remembered as where we've come from as we talk about the prospects of picking up the process at this point. Okay, now, how can we um, move forward. If there's some optimism, um, how do we move forward? I think there's two broad approaches, and I'm going to argue for the second. I think one broad approach says, um, time is running out, let's go for a final status agreement urgently, and let's apply pressure on the parties from outside to force them to the table and force them to make the agreement. I don't think there's any evidence at all that that kind of approach is going to be successful. Um, it's been tried in the past. I think there are elements of that model in Barack Obama's first term. And I think we've learned from that 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 doesn't really work. The two sides need to feel that they're not being pressured from the outside to be supported, or if there is pressure, it's certainly evenly balanced. The alternative approach is to say, let's focus upon next steps. Let's focus upon not end the conflict or final status agreement, but let's focus upon how we thinking back now to what the problems are, how do we stop things getting worse? How do we get the, the two sides talking to each other? How do we get the kind of compromise and trust involved between the leaderships so that we create a political space for something more serious and substantive to develop down the line? So I think there's a number of um, elements to this. I've set up some general principles or sensibility, if you like, to begin with. Work with the political reality on both sides and improve trust would be the first general principle. So diplomatic pressure should be balanced, but it's unbalanced it produces defensive reactions on um, either side. Opposed boycotts, boycott divestment and sanctions, and all of the talk of that is utterly counterproductive. Support dialogue, boycotts only convince Israelis there's no understanding, no partners, no, no awareness of the security needs. It forces Palestinian moderates who might want to engage and to negotiate into extremism. Utterly counterproductive, 
to put the two state Palestinians and don't give any legitimacy to the extremists. So I think there's a move at the moment, for instance, to bring Hamas back into in from the cold, to say, well, Hamas are now holding to their agreement formed in November, after Operation Pillar of Defense. They're attached to the Muslim Brotherhood. We talked to the Muslim Brotherhood. Rashid's been talked to Hamas. And I think this is, this is a diplomatic campaign. I think Qatar is involved in this campaign. I think it's um, dangerous. Not because Hamas can't be talked to when they do accept Israel's right to exist, when they have renounced violence, and when they do accept previous commitments and agreements made by the Palestinians, absolutely at that point, but we're not there. There's no sense in which um, Hamas has renounced its charter, which breathes the worst anti-Semitic hatred and threats of genocide towards the Jewish people, that they still talk a language as recently as December when Michelle made a major speech to his supporters of not one inch, we will liberate the land from the river to the sea, we do not accept the Zionist envy in any form at all. Now, if there's premature reconciliation, if the mass are brought into the process prematurely, that will end the negotiations. Israel can't be expected to sit down and negotiate with a force which seeks its destruction. So let's not get, um, let's not make that mistake. So the first principle, work with the political reality. Second principle, general principle, I think, is um, to stop things getting worse. So preserve the bottom of progress in Palestinian institution building. Promote regional conditions conducive to peace. That means, for instance, encouraging Arab actors to express their support for the two-state solution. Maintain the pressure on Iran as a keep it out, as a third-party spoiler to keep it away from the process. And limit the weapons smuggling in through Gaza, which, by the way, President Morsi has been more energetic at in recent weeks than President Mubarak ever was. The Egyptian armies we speak of filling some of those smuggling tunnels with raw sewage from Assafadagast. I think why? Because the Golden Brotherhood does not want the conflict with Israel. Egypt has very limited amounts of funding. It's uh, on its knees economically and wants to rebuild. So for now, at least, it's very firm to say that Hamas does not want the conflict with Israel to which it might be drawn in. Thirdly, general principle. Set realistic expectations of the end goal. There's an expression which is, um, so Israelis use, which is, we can meet the Palestinians' territorial needs when the Palestinians can meet our existential needs. And in part that is about the Jewish character of the state, in part it's about security. So when we need to set realistic expectations, yes, we can talk about the 67 lines as part of what will form the negotiating process in terms of reference, but we need also to be equally as blunt in saying that Palestinian return must be to the new Palestine and not to Israel itself. The British Foreign Secretary, William Hague, used a language of a fair, realistic, and agreed settlement to the refugee problem. That language of a realistic settlement to the problem, um, I think, is very important to be welcomed and could be more widely shared. Another general point would be get the language right. So this language of time is running out is really counterproductive. It can be well-meaning, especially from some foreign ministries in Europe, but the language is heard very differently by the likes of Hamas. It's heard as the time is running out, we just need to hang on a bit longer in our rejectionist uh, ways, and we will inherit um, the fallout. I think the better language is a language of resolve, determination, that there's no alternative to the two-state solution, a secure Israel, viable Palestine, support the moderates, oppose the extremists. The fifth general principle or sensibility, I'd say, is look for incremental ways to move forward. And this is where we talk about some next steps. I think there's five next steps. Firstly, American leadership. That, it seems that we might have. A new engagement from America to invest in the process and lead the international effort of third parties. This engagement, this leadership, will halt the negative dynamic and legitimize the participation of others in the process. Absolutely vital. Secondly, mutual concessions to create a new realistic basis for talks. Now, this ideas around confidence building measures, which are around now, I think are going to form a basis of some of the discussions. When I was in London recently, I was debating with the Palestinian ambassador, Manuel Assassi, and he showed real interest in these proposals, which um, we set out in a, a BICOM. Um, I'm aware I didn't talk about BICOM, so I will do um, later if that's all right. The Britain Israel Communications Research Center, I'm a senior research fellow, um, an independent British organization. We produced a paper by Brigadier General Michael Herzog, who was an assistant to Eddie Barak and a chief of staff to various defense ministers in Israel. 
And he, he participated in both seizing the moment in which he suggested a range of confidence building measures on both sides. And the Palestinian ambassador was very interested in them. He said they could certainly form the basis of discussions. The kind of ideas he had from the Israeli side were a partial freeze in settlement building outside the blocks, allowing the Palestinian Authority a bigger economic role in Area C, and even partial civil control. The West Bank is divided into areas A, B, and C with different um, rights and forms of control between the Israelis and uh, the Palestinian Authority. Allow the Palestinian security forces a bigger role in A and B, minimize Israeli incursions into area A, consider prisoner releases also. All of these confidence building measures in return for measures upon the other side, this is why I, I, I use the phrase coordinated incrementalism, which is a bit of a mouthful, but coordinated incrementalism simply means the incremental changes on one side should be met by incremental uh, changes on the other in a coordinated fashion. Palestinian um, confidence building measures could include the agreement not to take legal actions, no seeking new, new UN committee memberships and institutional memberships, agreeing to start substantive negotiations, to participate in a credible back channel, to maintain security cooperation with the IDF and the Americans, and to avoid premature reconciliation with Hamas until Hamas has agreed quartet conditions. Now, or not all of this has to be made public, and the process could be fed with other confidence building measures as it proceeds. But if it was successful, if it was possible to begin with the new mood being created by the American president, to move from there to some discussions about what the process could look like, to move from there to the coordinated proposals of some confidence building measures. You might begin to create a political space in which two kinds of discussion could happen. I think firstly a public channel of discussions, not necessarily negotiations, to demonstrate the new movement there is in the process, to encourage the two populations, um, and to engage in what some people call synchronized political messaging backwards towards your own constituencies to keep a more popular sense of involvement in the process. And secondly, different kinds of discussions in a secret, deniable back channel, which creates the freedom to discuss all issues. Certainly, um, Michael Herzog, who's been involved in um, the process for a long time, says, in my experience, this is the most effective way to make progress on all the core issues. It sidesteps the kind of public arguments, when these discussions become ripe, as happened with Oslo, they can be unveiled in a way that the public of both sides can be shown the benefits, not just the costs, of the conclusions the two negotiating partners have reached. The fourth step, I think, is an international campaign to stabilize the Palestinian Authority economy. If the Palestinian Authority can't pay its salaries to some 40% of its security personnel who are not showing up at the moment in some cases, then we're not in a place where we're going to get called risks made for peace by the Palestinians. Fifthly, I think international actors should coordinate with the US and with the parties and place their strengths. Independent and top-down initiatives will fail, and the message of resolve and support for the moderates and practical help for civil society and the Palestinian economy will all, I think, be able to succeed. So what I've tried to do is set out an argument for optimism. I hope I didn't sound overly optimistic. I'm certainly aware of a lot of the problems, no doubt some of the questions could, could explore some of those problems. I don't see any alternative. There's no alternative to an expression of national self-determination for the Jewish people and the Palestinian people other than the two-state solution. Nothing has international consensus behind it. Nothing has a track record of negotiations which have narrowed the gaps. Nothing has the support of the two peoples. So my argument is let's put aside talk one-state solution, let's put aside some of the pessimism, and let's really go at the prospects we have over 2013 of making a success of the two-state solution. So that's, that's my optimistic case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, when I was in Ramallah in September, we were talking to the Polster, Palestinian Polster, Howard Chicago. He said to us, when we pull Palestinians and they ask them, what, what's the top of your agenda, the thing you're concerned about most of all? They do talk about jobs, um, prosperity, economic security, and so on. It's not that they're not interested, obviously they want national self-determination. It's not, it's not that there's a, a choice between the two, but he talks about how important it is for the Palestinian people to feel that they've got an economic future as well. Now, to, again, to be optimistic for a moment, um, there was 
when the process was had more life in it, talk about what was called the economics of peace. Uh, Gordon Brown, who was the UK Prime Minister for a time, he led the way when he was uh, treasury at the Treasury in the UK on this, and he put a lot of things in place. Tony Blair, as the quartet leader, has tried to inject a lot of economic life and infrastructure building, new businesses into the Palestinian Authority also. We have an article in, in Fathom, the new issue of Fathom by a British MP called Liam Byrne, who was over recently, an ex-cabinet minister, and he talks about the potential there is for what he calls city-to-city -city hubs. In the, in the future, cities are going to be the big drivers, I think, of economic growth. They are already. It's where the intellectual capital is, where the social capital is, where the innovation is, where the finances are available. And he was talking about the potential of Israeli, Palestinian, and UK cities linking up together for economic growth. Again, visionary, but nonetheless positive and important to be sort of thing. If we want to get completely visionary, we remind ourselves of the language of Shimon Peretz, who at the height of the Oslo process did talk about a new Middle East. And so this is a, a vision, once the, the settlement is made, of a, of a world of permeable borders, economic zones, uh, and so on. And the combination, it's, there's some realism to this, which is a combination of incredible Israeli startup nation attitudes, high-tech innovation, and so on, and Palestinian entrepreneurship. The Palestinians have this real record of entrepreneurship. We need to look at the Palestinians in Jordan to understand all of that. What I would say, though, is that the general lesson we're learning, I think, and have learned, is that whether you're talking about biadism and nation building, or the economic development of the West Bank, it really does need a political track to go with it. It needs a political underpinning underneath it, or it can only really go so far. And if, if, there's, if there's a vacuum, eventually the economic processes start to wind back again. So, yes, I think you're absolutely right that when there's a political track again, and there's a, a new mood, economic development of the two areas will be, will be uh, an enormous boost to the process as a whole. The actual record is of what you didn't include in what you said to the audience, and this is exactly the kind of decontextualizing, demonizing discourse which doesn't help the process at all. What you didn't talk about was the reason the war and separation barrier went up, which was the second intifada, and a wave of suicide bombers blowing themselves up in Tel Aviv discotheques, Tel Aviv religious sites, Tel Aviv streets, Tel Aviv buses, and so on. You didn't give that context. You didn't give a context of some two to three hundred Israeli, thousand Israelis dying in the second intifada, tens of thousands traumatized and maimed, and thousands more than that psychologically damaged by an economy put into um, a dire strait. You didn't mention any of that. You didn't mention that the wall was built in response to the Israeli people's legitimate desire to be protected from terrorist attacks. You didn't tell them that 200 to 300 Israelis were killed in the 18 month period before the separation barrier was constructed, and in the period afterwards constructed, the attacks went down by 90%. You didn't say to people that if Australians were subjected to that kind of terrorism, in that kind of numbers, my goodness, they'd be screaming for their government to protect them from it. Now that's, that's when, when, when there's no political process, no political track, that's what happens. You get the extremists on both sides, um, you know, feeling that they've got the wind in the sails, and then we got uh, something like the second intifada. Now, President Abbas has said he's, he's committed to nonviolence, and he is. He, he's learned, you know, he, he's not going down the road of violence at all. And if that's true, then the checkpoints can come down, the wall can come down, and the various defensive barriers which Israel has put up against an onslaught of terrorism in, in the second intifada can come down too. So Israelis would say, Look, we tried land for peace at Camp David. We offered a gen generous offer with Barak at Camp David, a more generous offer still with Olmert at Annapolis, as generous as, as the Israeli people could possibly consider offering, and as yet we haven't had a response back from the other side. So that context matters. That kind of terrorism and that kind of scale matters, and that's the bigger picture that I think you, you didn't share with people. 
talk about the Irish, with all due respect, in the sense that you don't really understand what the conflict was about. There's no such thing as the Irish. There was a conflict between the Protestant majority in Northern Ireland, which saw itself as the British, and a Catholic minority in Northern Ireland, which saw itself as one to belong to the United Ireland. How did the process actually come to a resolution? And I used to take people over there very regularly and knew the parties involved in that dispute. It ended when the IOA accepted the Protestant majority's right to remain British. It ended when Martin McGuinness picked the phone up and literally rang the British government and said the war is over, but we need your help to bring us in. That's when all the discussions could start. When, if you like, two states or two peoples was accepted. A Northern Ireland for the Protestant majority and the Republic for um, uh, the Catholics and so on. So people talk about this as being parallel to Hamas. Have Hamas picked the phone up and said, our, our military conflict with um, Israel is over, bring us in, we want to participate in negotiations? Not at all. They were firing Farge, Iranian supplied Farge 5 missiles at Tel Aviv. 12,000 rockets in 12 years. Do you support that? Do you support the raining down of rockets on Israeli children? I go to school. It's practice. actually a war crime. I go to school. Practice. In terms of the Jewish lobby argument that you've just made, what you've really just said is that Jewish people control American foreign policy. Yeah, yeah. Mm. In relation yeah. to Israel, yes. Yeah. Well, I have the right to think that's uh, an argument which trades in anti-Semitism. And that's what I believe. You have the right to, to believe it if you want. I have the right to believe it's an argument that trades in anti-Semitism. It, project, it projects the old classic stereotypical picture of the Jew as all-controlling, as all-powerful, as provoking wars, as getting Gentiles to fight on their behalf. It trades in virtually every anti-Semitic stereotype there was during the 20th What's century. What's wrong with the United Nations? So um, I reject that too. What the United Nations? There's nothing wrong with the United Nations at all. Nothing wrong with the United Nations. The problem is, the solution to the national conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians will be conducted by face-to-face -face negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians. I don't hear you saying what was wrong with the United Nations when a deal was offered by the United Nations in 1947, which was accepted by the Zionists at the time when it became the State of Israel and was rejected by the Arabs. The day of declaration of the Israeli state produced five invaded Arab armies trying to strangle the infant Jewish homeland at birth which was defeated to the cost of 1% of the Jewish population at the time. So it's not a case that the United Nations hasn't had a role in the process. It couldn't have a positive role in the process still. But it's not in a position to impose on the two parties a solution. The solution will be developed by discussions and negotiation and compromise between the two parties. That's how national questions are solved, not by the United Nations um, in positions of solution. At the moment, in Cairo, there's ongoing negotiations between Israelis, actually IDF military officials, and mass officials with the Egyptians in the middle. And that, that's ongoing, and it's a result of the ceasefire that was declared after Operation Pillar of Defense in November. And those discussions, some people have hoped, could, could develop into a more sustained process of negotiation around questions such as access points, crossing points, and so on and so forth. Hopefully that's going to be the case. But the, the thing to remember is that when I was last there, one of the things I looked at was the crossing points that were built by the Israelis when they disengaged in 2005. And they're massive. They're capable of taking about 40,000 Gazans a day coming over to work into Israel and going back again. That, that the point Israel disengaged, was the whole. What Israel brought was a Hamas takeover of the Gaza Strip. Hamas threw Fatah militants from rooftops, hands tied, killing Fatah militants as a violent takeover of the Gaza Strip. And rockets start to rain down on southern Israel. 12,000 rockets in 12 years. The rockets themselves have got progressively more potent. So the kind of Katusha rockets, we've, we've gone from Katusha rockets and Grad rockets to Iranian supply. Farge 5 rockets, which had a 70 kilometer range, and which set off air, air sirens in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem in November. Now, no society, Barack Obama said himself, if my two daughters had rockets raining down on their heads, I would want my daughters to do something better to stop it. So that has been 
the basis of the Israeli response. In, yes, in, yes, if, as I'm saying, if it's, well, today, this, sadly it hasn't changed, I, people may not have known it, but the information coming through to me in the last hour or so is four rockets fell in Sarok this afternoon. Four rockets from the Gaza Strip. Yeah. Welcome to Barack Obama and to, to the area. Four rockets fell, there were no entries, thankfully. But, you know, I've been there and I've spoken to people, and, you know, people need to understand that, and you, you, you just does not take that much to imagine what it must be like. But, you know, there's a lot of traumatized children, as well as people have to spend their lives 15 seconds from a bomb shelter, and, you know, the government has to try and do all it can to keep the rocket ring out of Gaza. By the way, it isn't just an Israeli issue in the sense that there's a border with Egypt too, and as I said at the moment, Egypt is flooding some of those smuggling tunnels and is very worried about the relationship between some of the terrorists in the Gaza Strip and other terrorists who are now congregating in what's becoming a dead zone in the Sinai Desert, a dead zone from which terrorist attacks are being launched both against Israel and against Egypt, and 15 Egyptian soldiers were killed recently. It isn't just Israel's problem. So, but I agree with you, if it's possible at all to, to, to see blossoming the negotiations which are happening now over maintaining the ceasefire into a, a lessening of the restrictions on the Gaza Strip in such a way that would prevent weaponry falling into the hands of um, Hamas, then I'm sure that that's absolutely you know, what should happen and what would be being pursued in negotiations. But security is essential and has to be maintained.